Hello, everyone. We'll be starting in just a minute. Uh, We are having a few just technical difficulties, but we'll be started shortly. And for anyone who has um, raised their hand, um, pl please do not use the chat. Please use the Q&A for any questions that you might have. Again, please use the Q&A function for the webinar for any questions that you may have. Good afternoon and welcome to the second lecture in our series, Healthy Aging Series, Prepare, Prevent, and Get Proactive. My name is Jason Page. My role is Community Outreach Associate Supervisor at or for the Turner African American Services Council. The Healthy Aging Series is a collaboration between the four community programs, Michigan Medicine's Turner Geriatric Clinic, Silver Club Memory Programs, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, the Turner African American Services Council, the Turner Senior Wellness Program, the Turner Geriatric Clinic, the National Poll on Healthy Aging, the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation at the University of Michigan, and new this year, AARP. Our topic today is focus on falls, balance, mobility, and preventing injury with Dr. Lon Goldberg and Dr. Jeffrey Hoffman. Before we get started, a few words about Zoom, our presentation software platform. When using Zoom webinar platform, the main thing to know about is using the Q&A icon. To submit a question, simply click the Q&A icon, which is in the center bottom of your viewing window. You will type and submit your question and it will go to the moderator. While there is also a chat icon, please do not use the chat icon for questions about the lecture. Please use the Q&A. Please note that we now have closed caption option for you to use if you wish. On your Zoom computer screen, you will see an icon labeled CC. In the meeting controls, click on it for either closed captions or for a live transcript of this presentation. Finally, if you're having technical issues, such as your computer screen freezing up, please exit the webinar to alleviate these issues and then go back into it. If technical difficulties persist, call the Turner office at 734-998-93 Five, three. Once again, that's 734-998-9353. This session will be recorded and once it's edited, it will be uploaded to the Healthy Aging Series app, M-I-C-H-M-E-D dot O-R-G slash Healthy Aging. Once again, that's M-I-C-H-M-E-D dot O-R-G slash Healthy Aging. We will email registrants with a link when it's available. I'd also like to call your attention to the next lecture in this series on Friday, October 20th. Our lecture will be on brain health, what you should know and what you can do. Now today's lecture, we'll have a one hour presentation followed by 30 minute Q&A. Remember to pose your questions using the chat or the Q&A icon, not the chat icon. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Dr. Alan Goldberg graduated with a BSc in physio therapy from the University of Cape Town in 1988. He received his PhD in physical anthropology in 2003 from Wayne State University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in gerontology at the University of Michigan Institute of Gerontology with Dr. Neil Alexander as his mentor from 2003 to 2005. He currently serves as Associate Dean for Research in the College of Health Science at the University of Michigan Flint. His research focuses on balance, mobility, and physical performance measures in older adults. 
Dr. Hoffman is a health services researcher and gerontologist. His research focuses on the quality of care and Medicare policies affecting physical functioning and safety for older adults. Specific topics of interest include prevalence, risks, and outcomes associated with fall injuries, implications of family and friend caregiving for older adults, injury preventions, well-being, and interactions with the health care system, and how Medicare reimbursement influences older individuals' long-term functioning safely and caring patterns. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan Goldberg. Can can you see this, uh, Jason? Can everyone can, see the screen? The screen looks great. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank Dr. you. Goldberg. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction and for the invitation to talk on the topic of balance, mobility, and uh, how we can prevent injury um, in relation to falls. Um, and I'm just going to advance my slides. Okay, so we're talking about falls and injuries that are related to falls. And a lot of research has gone into showing that in the segment of the population, adults 65 and older, falls are common. They're very costly in terms of injury and loss of human life. However, the good news is that they are preventable and they are not an inevitable, inevitable part of aging. So how common are they? In 2020, about 14 million or a little more than one in four, 27.6% of older adults reported that they'd had a fall in the previous 12 months. The number in Michigan was a little higher than that. It was closer to 30%, 29.4 of older adults reported a fall. And that turned out to be about 512,000 approximately older adults reported a fall in Michigan. In 2018, 27.5% reported a fall and 35.6 .5 million falls were, were recorded. In terms of injury and, and loss of human life, uh, in 2018, 10% of older adults reported that they had sustained a fall-related injury, and there were a total of eight, more than eight, almost eight and a half million fall-related injuries. And there were three million emergency room visits, almost a million, 950,000 uh, visits to the hospital as a result of those falls, and 32,000 deaths. By 2021, the number had crept up to 38,700 deaths um, due to a fall. And healthcare costs are very expensive, obviously. 50 billion, 50 billion, that's billion with a B, are spent annually on, on, uh, on falls. So it is clear that this is a, a big, large public health crisis, and we need to do everything we can to prevent falls. And the good news is that there are ways that we can prevent falls. So what are the risk factors for falls? And there are many risk factors for falls that have been identified by many researchers. And typically, a typical categorization is that they're broken up into both intrinsic and, and extrinsic factors. The intrinsic factors are factors that relate to the individual themselves, that are inherent to the individual. And the extrinsic ones essentially relate to the environment that the individual uh, interacts with. And many of these risk, some of these risk factors, not all of them are modifiable, which means we can intervene do some sort of treatment, some sort of intervention and change them. Some of them are not modifiable, such as advanced age and previous falls. We cannot change our age and we cannot change our previous history of falls. But we can change many of the, of the items on the screen, such as muscle weakness and our walking and balance problems, which will be the essentially the, much of the talk that I will present today. We can certainly change, we can uh, work on our vision. We can be referred to an ophthalmologist or an optometrist. We can treat our chronic conditions, and we can also treat things like fear of falling. And we'll talk a little bit about fear of falling towards the end of this talk. There's a whole host of extrinsic factors, and those are the environmental factors, which many of those are modifiable. So we can alter the home environment. And I'll, I'll provide evidence to you to show you 
that there are benefits to doing that. So in this talk, of, of which essentially is about preventing uh, injuries and preventing falls uh, in older adults, um, I think it's really important that we understand that physical activity is a major component of our ability to decrease the risk of falls as well as injury from a fall. In 2018, the federal government commissioned and reported out on the physical activity guidelines for Americans, the second edition, and one of the most important sentences in that entire document in relation to falls is the following. It says that for older adults, multi-component physical activity is important to improve physical function and decrease the risk of falls or injury from a fall. Multi-component physical activity, and we'll talk a lot about what that is. That can help us to reduce, decrease the risk of falls as well as injury from a fall. So what do we mean by multi-component physical activity? And it's, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's really a combination of various types of exercise and physical activity that we can engage in. So when we talk of multi-component physical activity, reducing our risk for falls and fall-related fall injuries, we're talking of combining aerobic activity, which we can think of as activity, activity that gets the heart rate up as well as increases our breathing rate, some people will call that cardio or endurance type of activity. That's, that's common. Uh, we could combine that with muscle strengthening uh, types of activity, um, exercises that increase the strength of uh, leg muscles, arm muscles, muscles of the trunk, uh, uh, upper extremity and lower extremity. And very important in terms of this uh, uh, talk, as are all three of these, is uh, a com combining balance activity in order to reduce falls and risk for fall-related injuries. But it also, uh, multi-component physical activity also includes gait training, training and walking, coordination training, as well as training and physical function activities. In addition, multi-component physical activity also includes recreation activities, which incorporate multiple types of PA, uh, physical activity. So dancing and yoga so are, are, are included in multi-component physical activity. When we do a dancing, uh, a dance class or a dancing, we go to a dance with a partner or however we, we do this, um, dancing has an aerobic capacity. It also may help to improve our balance. So it, it taps into at least two of the three, uh, the big three as, as we might call them of multi-component physical activity. Yoga also, uh, th there may be some strength benefits. There, may, there are some strength benefits to yoga. There's some balance uh, and, and coordination uh, benefits. Tai Chi as well. He has a group of people practicing Tai Chi moves, which can help them with their, with their balance. Uh, activities such as gardening. We typically don't sort of think of that as exercise, but it falls under the whole sort of uh, category of, of physical activity. And there's benefits in terms of strength, as well as mobility and, and even balance um, and aerobic uh, benefits as well, depending on the effort that one puts in and a whole host of sports. So let's talk a little bit about specifically some examples of physical activities for older adults. These come straight out of the physical activity guidelines. And we, as older adults, we can, we can do many activities under the, under the category of aerobic activities, which will, which will increase our heart rate and increase our breathing, our breathing rate. We could engage in walking, hiking, dancing, swimming. We could take an aerobics class. We could jog or run if we're so inclined. We could also do an aerobics class uh, not in the water, in other words, on land as part of a group exercise class. Some forms of yoga may have an aerobic component. Cycling is a very good example of, of aerobic activities, whether you're doing indoor cycling on a stationary bicycle or, or, uh, or, extra, or outside cycling. Uh, yard work, such as raking, pushing, raking and pushing a lawnmower. Uh, could have very much uh, an aerobic component, component to it. Uh, sports such as tennis, basketball, walking as part of a golf uh, outing that you might do also could have an aerobic, would have an aerobic component. And then we can also think about the muscle strengthening activities that we can do. We can do a whole host of those. We could use simple, we don't necessarily have to go to the gym for, 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 uh, for our strengthening exercise. We could do them using exercise bands that uh, physical therapists use commonly to, to work with their patients. 
We could use weight machines in a gym, or we could use simple handheld weights, which, we, which you could buy at our local sports goods store. Or we could use cuff weights as well, which we could wrap around our limbs. And I'll show you pictures of many of these later on. Body weight exercises are, are very good as well, where we could do, we, if, if we're able to, we could do push-ups, we could do pull-ups, could do squats, lunges, knee bends, all sorts of things, items of, of, of muscle strengthening, which improve our strength uh, just using our body weight. Uh, gardening, digging, lifting, and carrying as part of gardening, carrying the groceries. Many of these things you'll see are items or activities that we do inherently almost every day. Well, a couple of times a week, we go to the grocery store and we have to bring, takes us 15 minutes to, off, to, uh, to load the car at the, at the grocery store and then we offload it again when we get home. So carrying those of those groceries could, could provide and does provide muscle strengthening uh, physical activity and some yoga postures and some forms of Tai Chi as well are good forms of muscle strengthening activities. But we should also remember that it's important for us as part of our multi-component training program is to do balance training. And I'll talk more about balance training later on. And balance training could be either static or dynamic training, and it improves our ability to resist the forces that challenge our equilibrium or our control of our body, our, our balance point, our center of mass. And that could lead to a fall when our equilibrium is disturbed. And there's many, many kinds of, of training that we can do. Uh, when we do when we do uh, balance training, a couple of, some of these are walking backwards, sideways stepping, sideways walking, standing on a wobble board. This is a big one that physical therapists train their patients to do. You could also do standing on one leg or doing a strength exercise of the arm. So there you're combining a balance exercise together with a, with uh, with a strengthening exercise. And we'll talk a little bit later about progressing exercise, but you can see. In this one, which happens to be a picture of me, I have a chair next to me and I'm standing on one leg and you can see my arms are to the side. If I, if need be, I could have had a table or, or some other sturdy um, apparatus to make sure that I don't fall. So safety is always important. And there's many, many health benefits associated with physical activity for older adults. And you can see that I've, I've earmarked here uh, improving our overall physical function, which will lower our risk of falls and lower the risk of fall-related injuries. Immediately above that, this one is improvements in bone health. As we do weight-bearing activities, there's, there's an improvement in bone health. And obviously any improvement in bone health is likely to reduce the risk of a fracture in the uh, unfortunate event that we do take a fall. But even though we're talking about falls and, 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 and reducing of falls, it is worth thinking about some of the other benefits that accrue to us from, acti from activity in terms of reduction in heart disease, reduction in all-cause mortality and dying, reducing the risk of blood pressure, of, of increased or elevated blood pressure, diabetes, uh, cholesterol, our blood lipid profile. Um, it lowers the risk of the, the, the likelihood or the risk of getting many cancers. And remember what we're talking about here is, is dealing with risk. That doesn't mean that none of us will ever get to have, a, have high blood pressure or reduce or, or not get cancer, because we all know that, that that does happen, but it lowers the likelihood of us um, contracting some of those diseases, illnesses, or conditions. So in terms of this talk, um, we want to understand that physical activity can reduce falls. And there's a vast majority, a vast array of, of studies that, that, that bears out that engaging in physical activity, multi-component physical activity, does in fact reduce falls. So when I show you an, a, a study such as this one by Gillespie in 2012, or the, lower, the third one down by Sherrington in 2017, you might, be, you might think that this is just one study. Well, this is what's known as the systematic review. And each of these systematic reviews are made up of multiple other studies, and they're combined into many of these studies. So if I remember correctly, the study by Sherrington, where it shows that exercise reduces the rate of falls in older adults by 21%, I believe that there might be something like, if I remember correctly, and I can check on this, there were something like 88 clinical trials that went into combining uh, to, to provide us with that number of uh, reducing falls by 21%, the rate of falls by 21%. And there was something, if I remember correctly, there were many, many thousands, I forget how many thousand people were involved in those 88 trials. Uh, and the same thing with Gillespie. I forget exactly how many trials were in that one, but there were many 
many thousands of people involved. It could easily be of the order of 5,000 people in many of these trials, and some of them have, have many more than 5,000 people. So, we're, so we should not think, that, oh, that's just one trial, that, that one study. These are systematic reviews and meta-analyses, which means that the, that the researchers have combined, they've scanned the literature and combined multiple, many, many trials and many, many thousands of patients and research participants into these trials to come up with a number that says falls and rate of falls can be reduced by 29% or 15% or 32%. And you can see this variability, but it seems to hover around the 15 to 30% for that physical activity can reduce, uh, can reduce falls. And doubtless there'll be some that show more and some that show less. But there is a strong body of evidence that says that engaging in multi-component physical activity will in fact reduce falls. And the same thing, the same remarks could be I could give the exact same story about reducing fall-related injuries. So he has two systematic reviews by Gillespie and El Khoury. And between those two systematic reviews, there were many thousands of people in those two systematic reviews. And they showed that the, the, it reduced the risk of fall-related fractures by 61 to 66%. It reduced the rate of injurious falls, a fall-related injury. And this includes all injuries by 37%. And then it exercise reduce severe injury from falls, which required hospitalization for, for, uh, for injuries such as fracture, head injuries, soft tissues that required suturing by 43% in that study of systematic reviews. And there was another that reduced the number of fall-related fractures by 38%. So you can see it seems to cover the fall-related fracture, uh, fall-related injuries based on this sample that I pulled uh, were, uh, were from 37 to 66. But once again, if we scan the literature, we could find different figures, but there's clear evidence that there is benefit to engaging in multi-component physical activity in order to, relate, to reduce fall-related injuries. So the question becomes, how much should we do? How much exercise and physical, physical activity should we do? Um, it, according to the guidelines, well, let me, let me back up. In 2023, there was a mid-course report. These guidelines come out every 10 years. So there was a guideline in 20, 2008, there was also one in 2018. And then in 2023, every five years, uh, there's one in between. And these guidelines and, and mid-course reports, as they call them, state that we should be doing moderate intensity aerobic activity of at least 150 minutes to 300 minutes per week. If we want to engage in vigorous intens intensity aerobic activity, we could go down to 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity intensity aerobic activity. So those are the numbers for aerobic activity, the stuff that gets the, ac the activity that gets our heart beating faster and gets us breathing. And you could ask, well, what is moderate activity? Well, moderate activity is where you do the talk test. If you, you should be able to talk, but not sing. If you can sing while you're doing it, you're not doing moderate intensity uh, aerobic activity. You should be able to say, to be able to talk. In terms of vigorous activity, you, you may be able to say a couple of words, but not much more than that because it's so vigorous. You also should be able to, you also should be doing, we all should be doing muscle strengthening activities that make our muscles work much harder than usual uh, on at least two days a week. Some, some, some authors will say more than two days a week. And then of course, you also need to be doing balance activities. And I'll talk more about the types of balance activities that we should be doing. Those, those, those are uh, activities that should be dosed at least three times a week. They should uh, perturb our move. They should be um, challenging us that we really move our center of gravity and our, our balance point of our, of our body. The trunk, we should be moving. And, and while we certainly could be doing and should be doing some static activities in terms of balance, you could stand on one leg, but you'll get greater, you'll get greater benefits if you actually do physical activity um, balance exercises that perturb or move the body center of mass, where you're actually moving and reaching and challenging the balance point of the body. So when we stumble and lose balance, what happens? When we lose our balance, such as, and this has happened to, to me certainly many times in our venture, that to most, to many, if not most of the people on this call, is that we, 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 we kick a crack in the sidewalk or there's a stone on the sidewalk that we don't see and we trip Typically, we regaining our balance, our, our trunk lunges forward. We typically have to take a rapid step to, to regain our balance. In order to avoid a fall, the step needs to be very rapid. Uh, a slow step won't do it, and, we'll, and we may end up on the ground. So stepping speed, it turns out, is much slower in older adults than it is in our younger, com, uh, our younger colleagues. 
And therefore, it's important to have low extremity function needs to be, uh, we have to have good low extremity function in terms of strength and power and speed in terms of uh, being able to take a rapid step. So when we think of, we need to have good strength, we understand that we need to have strength, which means that we, we have, um, uh, we're able to lift a, an, a, a, strong, a, bit, a high load with our, with, our, um, with our leg or push in the gym with a, a, high, with a, a large amount of force. When we think of power, we're thinking of power is the combination of how much force that we can generate as well as the speed at which we can generate that force. So we need to be training not only our strength, but also the power. So as we're doing strength training, we should also be doing power training as well. So let's talk a little bit about the various types of activities that fall under each of these categories. Uh, and these, many of these you can do at home um, with, with relatively not specialized and relatively inexpensive equipment. A stationary bicycle is always a good thing to be, to be doing because you could be you could exercise at home you could be doing the legs as well as the arms with this one which i used a lot and do use a lot now you could walk briskly to to get an aerobic uh, workout you know walking and just smelling the roses is a good thing but if you really want to get your 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 um, heart rate and and blood heart rate and uh, breathing up you need to be doing some you need to be doing brisk walking you always need to think are you safe to do brisk walking because brisk walking could be could have problems if you're if you're at high risk for a fall. So be careful of that unless you're, you know, you need to be safe. Or you could do a jog. Sometimes I decide to intersperse my walking with some jogs, or I, I uh, walk in place. Marching in place is a good thing to do. Uh, there's a test called the two-minute walk where we assess aerobic capacity, how many times an older adult uh, can can step in place. And then also strengthening exercise are things that you can do at home. These are some exercise that I do on a fairly regular basis at home when I'm not in the gym. I do walk, you can do wall push-ups. Um, what I've got uh, around my, the, the, if you're moving across on the right, I, I'm doing a biceps curl there and you can see I'm using a cuff weight. This cuff weight is either one and a half or two pounds um, or kilos, I think it might be in kilograms. Uh, and you can bend, flex and extend the arm to, to um, strengthen the biceps. You can also use your arms pushing up on the on the uh, on a sturdy chair. If you have a sturdy chair, you can push up and down to strengthen the triceps. And you can also see on the bottom right hand corner, I've got a cuff weight around my uh, lower forearm where I'm going to be straightening at the elbow and lowering it down to strengthen my, my triceps. In other words, the muscle behind the um, the, the muscles behind the, uh, the the upper arm. And other strengthening exercises you can do in a seated position where I've put a cuff weight on my leg. And I'm straightening and bending so to to strengthen the quadriceps. Um, here I'm I'm bent. The next one on the right, I'm bending the leg up and down to strengthen the hamstrings. The next one, I'm standing, holding onto a chair, doing knee bends to strengthen the the the, the gluteal or the backside muscles as well as the thigh muscles. With a straight leg on the bottom left, I'm strengthening my hamstrings and gluteal muscles. Where, uh, the next one at the bottom on the right, uh, in the middle on the lower the lower panel. I'm strengthening the, uh, the hip muscles that move the leg or abduct the leg, as we call it. And then you can also do exercises going from sit to stand in a chair, going up and down to strengthen um, uh, uh, leg, leg and, uh, and hip muscles. And then in terms of balance, we could step to the side. We could walk with our hands, uh, heel toe, helps us to perturb our balance. The top, the top right hand one, I'm stepping over, moving, for, uh, walking by stepping over. You can see on the bottom one, I'm more cautious. So if you're more cautious about your balance, I'm walking heel toe, but I'm holding onto uh, the adjacent wall or the adjacent door. And other balance exercises could be where I'm standing on one leg with my arms out to the side. And another walking type uh, exercise, which will challenge my balance is where I walk in and out of various cones or, or um, plastic uh, cups, for want of a better way of putting it, and I'm walking in a zigzag figure of eight type of fashion between these and turning around. Um, let me just talk a little bit about fear of falling before, uh, before I ask Dr. Hoffman to jump in. So fear of falling is an important concept to, for us to understand, and it's, it goes in the literature, and many, uh, many older adults do have what 
we call this fear of falling. In the literature, in the medical literature, it's sometimes thought of as uh, or listed as concern about falling. It's also concerned about, uh, talked about as balanced confidence. And it's also talked about as efficacy, our falls efficacy, how confident we are in performing certain balanced activities. And a strong predictor of fear of falling is people who, who say, I've had a fall in the past 12 months. History of prior falls is a predictor of fear of falling, the research shows. And, restrict, and, and fear of falling can cause us to restrict our activities to avoid doing certain activities, which can have deleterious effects, such as making us weaker, loss of coordination, loss of strength, and loss of balance if we avoid our activities and choose to sit in a chair for much of the day and watch television. So fear of falling can have very deleterious confidence. But the good news is that there is evidence that exercise activities such as strengthening, balance uh, activities uh, can improve uh, balance confidence and fear of falling. So there is, there is, there are certain activities that people can do in terms of exercise and physical activity to help us with uh, those of us who might have a fear of falling as a result of a prior fall or some other cause. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is home safety. Um, and there is research to show that hazards in the home um, can cause people to fall. But if we, uh, if we intervene and modify the environment, um, then we can reduce the rate of falls by 26%, according to this study by Clemson et al. And people at high risk of falling derive the most effect from these interventions, so 38%. So we can reduce the risk for falls. And it turns out that these interventions are most effective when an occupational therapist goes into the home and suggests some of these uh, fall hazard uh, safety adaptations. Occupational therapists are experts in, in home assessments and in uh, affecting um, these interventions uh, to the home environment. I've given you a link here to a, to a brochure by the CDC, which gives you a whole host of of um, suggested items to look for. And these are the ones that many of us understand. It's important to remove clutter. It's important to, to make sure that the stairs are, that you have railing on the stairs. That's, that's, a, that's a harder modification to do, but we do need grab bars and uh, in the toilets and the bathroom and all sorts of others. There's a list on, on one of these slides uh, that, I, that I showed earlier, as well as in the, um, the brochure that I've given you over here. And I've also included a, a number of references for you if you want to get, you know, if you want to look at some of the articles that I referenced, as well as some of the websites from the CDC, from the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, as well as from the Public Health uh, Image Library of the CDC, which from where I use some of these images. Some of the images were also from the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion with their permission. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and I believe there'll be time for questions and answer later on. And um, I will hand it over to, to Dr. Hoffman. Great. Thank you, Dr. So I've stopped sharing, Jeff. Yep, I think we're good. Can you see my screen? We can, it looks yes, good. Yes, we can. Great. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg, that was wonderful. Hello everyone, I'm uh, Jeffrey Hoffman. I'm a assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Nursing and a gerontologist who studies fall injury and policy. <clears throat> uh, I thought that was a wonderful overview of um, fall injury, and uh, in particular, the benefits of physical activity from Dr. Goldberg. I'm going to sort of broaden out to um, a little bit of a bigger picture on trends in fall injuries and dive into some of the, the recent research and literature, including what's happened during the pandemic, uh, things to think about when it comes to fall prevention, and then provide, um, broaden out to some additional um evidence base for fall prevention, as well as some specific resources here in the community locally, as well as um, some additional things in addition to what Dr. Goldberg talked about, the uh, steady brochures from the CDC about fall prevention. So as I say, I'm going to do a very brief overview. I think we just got a really nice introduction to fall injuries. I'm going to talk briefly about Michigan statistics and then some recent research prevention resources. So. Um, 
you know, we heard that about a third of older adults fall in a given year, um, and uh, about 10% overall of older individuals have um, uh, an injury after a fall that's treated medically. Um, and, you know, there's great concern about falls leading to institutionalization and loss of independence. Um, Michigan in particular, um, we exhibit a lot of the same trends as nationally. So here's just a figure illustrating the um, significance of fall injury when it comes to medical causes of hospitalization. So we can see across varying age groups from middle age to older adults, um, falls are a leading cause of injury-related hospitalization. Nationally, they're the leading cause of injury-related ED use and hospitalization. Um, the 45 to 54 age group falls represent about a third of all injury hospitalizations. But as we move into the older age groups, um, they pretty much dominate the category of injury hospitalizations. Um, so, you know, they're, they're a reason for concern. They consume a lot of healthcare resources, as Dr. Goldberg mentioned. They cause nearly five times the injuries as motor vehicle crashes. And in, within Michigan, medical spending totals a significant amount of resource uh, use, a billion and a half dollars in 2014. That's only grown since then. We also have a fall-related death rate that's rising faster in Michigan than nationally. So with that in mind, I'd like to cover um, a few um, bigger picture research topics, um, thinking about why the trends we're seeing are going on and um, an overview of some of our sort of policy suppositions and other ideas for, for what might be going on. So there's some reasons for concern, certainly. Um, I don't wanna dampen enthusiasm. I think at the individual level and the population level, fall injuries are uh, relatively preventable, but there certainly are some areas for concern. So first off, fall injury rates do continue to rise. Um, and this is in spite of tremendous national efforts, concerted efforts from policymakers at the state, local and federal level to address fall injuries and to increase prevention efforts. So the prevention brochures that were mentioned earlier and that I'll touch again on later in this talk were spearheaded by the Centers for Disease Control, uh, the CDC, and they introduced a number of really useful um, educational materials for patients, families, and caregivers, as well as for clinicians. Um, in some of the work that I've done, however, we've seen that these you, these resources are not commonly used by older individuals and family members, including we interviewed people at hospitals who were labeled as high risk for falls. Um, they hadn't heard of a lot of these brochures. So, you know, a lot of efforts gone into educational campaigns without um, the, the results we might have been hoping for. There's also been a lot of concerted efforts for preventing in hospital falls, as well as some new novel post-discharge interventions. Um, that said, we see a continued increase in the rates of fall injuries. So this was a study we did recently using um, fairly recent data from 2016 to 2019. And what we saw were um, during that four year period about a four and a half percent increase in the rate of fall related injuries in the US. And that translates to about an extra 100,000 fall injuries in the US per year, um, which is a lot over that four year period, excuse me. And that was for the median sort of average county in the US. For higher risk counties, that grew even more. Another concern is that there's a lot of variation geographically in fall injury risks. And um, we in fact see about a twofold variation where some counties have twice as many fall injuries as other areas. And there are a lot of ways to think about this, but one way we might understand it is that there's a mismatch in the prevalence or risk of falls in a community, in any given community, and then the resources that we allocate for preventing falls. So you'll see in this particular, in, in two figures that I'm about to show, um, this mismatch that I'm speaking of. So this is a figure from the study we recently did that um, shows 
the distribution or the prevalence of fall injuries across the US. These are counties in the small boxes on the screen. So in yellow are areas with higher fall entry rates and the darker colors are areas with lower fall entry rates. And you can see sort of slicing right through the middle of the US, the central states, higher adjusted fall injury rates. And these are adjusted for age. So it's not necessarily that certain areas have older age groups that are higher risk for falls. These are already um, including those age distributions. So if you look at this map, but then the subsequent map I'm about to share shows the resources that we allocate for fall preventions. So here are some prevention interventions shown in blue, yellow, orange, and purple. Um, and these are various interventions that I'll talk about in a minute that, that could include multi-component exercise programs um, that Dr. Goldberg discussed. And what you can see is there, these programs are highly concentrated in terms of their availability throughout the US. So this isn't necessarily ex completely comprehensive, but gives a sense that um, the Midwest, Upper Midwest, Southeast regions, Northeast, and some areas in California have a greater number of these programs, of this type of fault prevention programming, but there's sparse offerings in a lot of the other states. So if you overlay these two maps on one another, you can see that some of the areas in yellow with the, the greatest prevalence of fall injuries simply don't have access to a lot of these programs that would be available in places like local senior centers, um, community recreation um, centers and whatnot. So this is, this is one potential reason this mismatch between resources and um, fall risk that might be driving continued increases in fall injury rates. Another one that uh, listeners might be familiar with is we have a Medicare program covering 99.5% of the US older adult population. But Medicare, when it comes to fall injury, in some respects has very generous coverage, but in other respects is fairly parsimonious, in particular on the side of prevention. So let me explain what I mean by that. So. Medicare is extraordinarily generous when it comes to paying for acute medical care and post-acute care. So um, if you have a fall injury, Medicare will pay for the cost once the injury has occurred and it'll pay for subsequent rehabilitation um, that can be quite costly for a time limited period. It will pay for medical equipment or what we call durable medical equipment, things like canes, walkers, assistive devices, um, however, it won't update it routinely. Um, so if you have a wheelchair that um, needs a replacement, Medicare may not do that for five years. Um, Medicare also has limited vision coverage yeah, um, in some cases when it comes to prescription eyewear. Um, Medicare also will pay for limited skilled support after an injury, as I say. So um, that's really generous and helpful. Uh, it also does a limited amount of prevention at the Medicare annual wellness visit where you can get a fall risk assessment and referral for an intervention for fall prevention. That said, Medicare won't generally pay for fall prevention. So these include some of the things that Dr. Goldberg mentioned that are pretty critical and our best guess at the ways we can most effectively prevent fall injuries. So things like home modifications, Medicare in many cases will help you get an assessment for the risk that you have in your home where most falls occur, but it won't pay for the actual home modifications or renovations, things like installing grab bars or improving your lighting or changing your light bulbs or fixing stairs or installing a ramp. It also typically will not pay for community interventions, physical activity programs, some of the things that I just showed you uh, in the earlier map. And what it, Medicare really isn't designed for, unfortunately, is longer term functional support, which is the exact type of support we need when we're thinking about the sorts of things that engender fall risk, those intrinsic and extrinsic factors. So that's a second reason beyond a mismatch of resources and need, which is um, sort of limitations with Medicare policy. And I could go on about that, but to keep it brief, I'll add a third one, which is we might expect continued growth in fall injury rates. And this has to do with the pandemic. So I'm sure everyone here has had their own experience, personal experience um, or has tried to forget it with the pandemic, although of course the challenge is ongoing as we all know. 
Um, but I'd like to share some research that came out about the pandemic when it comes to fall-related risks and fall injuries. So we did a national survey uh, in December of, uh, rather January of 2021 through AARP, um, which surveyed 2000 older adults across America, ages 50 to 80. And we asked a bunch of questions about falls and fall risks. So I'd like to share some of these findings with you. So the first thing is about a quarter of older adults reported having a fall during this period, but was most striking while many of those said that the fall entailed an injury requiring medical care, 12% reported delaying getting needed medical care during the early part of the pandemic, and 16% didn't get that care at all. So a total of about one in three either had to forego medical care or delay it due to the pandemic. Um, and we know how serious many fall injuries can be. And so this is pretty concerning just as a, as a, um, big picture issue about falls during the pandemic. Then we drilled down to try to understand factors that might influence what was going on in the older adult population when it came to fall risks. So one thing we focused on, given the absolute critical nature of physical activity when it comes to falls that's been discussed, um, we asked uh, survey respondents about their um, behaviors when it came to physical activity during the pandemic. And you can see here that we sort of split into two groups uh, in, in this age population. So those there were some groups that did a lot of physical activity. They did 28% did every day or nearly every day. Um, and some groups even became more active during the pandemic, 13% did. But we also had some groups who generate some concern for us. And specifically 37% became less active during the pandemic. So what does this mean? So one third reduced their physical activity. We also found that 20% or one fifth reported having worsened mobility. Another quarter reported having worse physical conditioning. That is their capacity for engaging in physical activity. These are pretty worrisome um, findings that came through the survey. And we also identified particularly bad um, outcomes during the early pandemic for lower income, isolated and lonely individuals. To illustrate that, we saw um, that lower income individuals, those with incomes in a household of less than 60,000, a quarter of them had worsened mobility during the early pandemic. For those who lacked companionship, some of the time or often, a third had worsened mobility and those who felt isolated, a third had worsened pandemic. What this seems to say is that the pandemic resulted in isolation for a lot of us, reduced physical activity, which in turn resulted in worsened mobility and physical conditioning. So why should we care about this and why is this influencing national trends in fall injury rates? Well, we know that as physical activity declines and social isolation increases, mobility and deconditioning worsen. So we're seeing sort of the, the beginnings of a national deconditioning epidemic, if you will, and that in turn leads to fears of heightened fall risk. So in a study we did using these survey data, we, we identified this exact problem. So what we found was that for individuals who are socially isolated compared to those who didn't feel socially isolated, there was a 50% or one and a half times increase in the risk of worse physical conditioning and mobility. Beyond a link between social isolation and those two big risk factors for falls. We also saw that people with reduced physical activity had two and a half to three times the risk of worsened physical conditioning and mobility. And those who had reduced time on their feet on a daily basis also reported about twice the risk compared to those who didn't reduce their time on, a, on their feet every day for worsened conditioning and mobility. So how does this all relate to falls? Well, it turns out that people with increased social isolation had 24 to 30% greater risk of falls and fear of falling. Those with the worsened mobility had 70% and 100% increases in the risk of falls and fear of falling. And those with the worsened physical condition had twice the risk of fear of falling. So those are three reasons why fall injury rates might be increasing. And there are a host of other ones, mismatches between resources and needs, local and federal policies, not providing the resources that are needed. Um, and third, 
external events that are going on that are making um, making it harder to do the sorts of things we do to reduce fall injury. So I want to zone in on one last area where I think is of particular interest um, for me studying falls and where we might turn additional attention to preventing falls. So we've noticed that falls tend to exhibit what we think of as an iceberg phenomenon, that we don't necessarily what's, know all the time what's going on underneath the surface with individuals' health and function and sensory impairment. But falls are a good indicator that occur once in a while that let us know that there are underlying issues to address. And these issues tend to show themselves most around a hospitalization. So here's a figure from a study that shows with these squiggly lines that sort of suddenly have sharp upticks near the blue line in the middle, which is a hospitalization, that fall injury risks increase dramatically right before people are hospitalized. And I should say that these increases aren't due to um, fall injuries resulting in hospitalization. These are fall injuries that do not directly lead to a hospitalization. So what we see is right before hospitalization, people's fall risk increases substantially. And it also remains really high right after hospitalization. So you can see these spikes in risk in the peri-hospitalization period. And what this also means is that fall injuries, we've you've probably heard a lot about hospital readmissions um, and there are lots of efforts afoot to try to reduce hospital readmissions but less focus on fall injuries. But in fact, what we see is that fall injuries are a leading readmission diagnosis. You can see over here the third leading readmission diagnosis overall for all readmissions, for all readmitted Medicare beneficiaries. For people with prior falls, they're the second leading diagnosis of a readmission. And for those with cognitive impairment, they're the second leading reason. So what can we do about all of these things? We can try to think about addressing them with policy as well as the sorts of activities that Dr. Goldberg pointed out to address them as at an individual level. So I'm trying to take a population policy-based approach in my thinking about it. So one thing we know for preventing hospital-related falls is to manage the post-discharge period. So for loved ones of mine or individuals I know going to the hospital, things that I would like to check in on when they are around the time of a discharge from the hospital are things like symptom monitoring, monitoring and management, medication checks, making sure they don't have medications that interact and can cause hypotension or low blood pressure that can make one faint and experience a fall. Uh, we've all probably been in a clinical setting or if we've had the, the misfortune of being in a hospital too many times that you can... Uh, experience poor nutrition and hydration during a hospital stay. You can lack social support and feel pretty lonely and isolated there. And you may, after a hospital visit, not experience uh, a primary care visit. So these are all things that, um, if implemented more successfully, might help prevent a post-discharge fall or a readmission for a fall injury. And this is some evidence to back that up. What we studied was a national Medicare policy that was designed to reduce readmissions. And what they did were was incentivize hospitals to use all of those types of interventions I just mentioned, symptom management, uh, medication management, encouraging patients to see a primary care physician after a fall. And what we saw, and you can sort of see in this figure, are after the implementation of the policy, real large decreases in fall injury rates uh, that were due to the policy. And we saw that with both 30-day um, fall injuries, as well as 90-day fall injuries. All of which to say, when we're seeing 12 to 20% reductions in fall injuries after hospital discharge due to a national policy to reduce readmissions, this gives us a little more optimism than I've been presenting more generally, that there are ways from a policy perspective to reduce falls beyond just putting the onus on individuals to improve their physical health. So the good news is that falls are relatively preventable and policy might matter. So let me talk a little more in the few in the in the 10 minutes I have left to talk about some prevention and resources. So Dr. Goldberg spent a considerable amount of time discussing the very strong and rich evidence base for several of these categories, in particular exercise as a prevention mechanism for fall prevention. 
uh, multi-component exercise and gait balance and strength training. So I'd like to just give a very brief overview again of those and some other things that we know can, in many cases, help prevent falls. So resummarizing what Dr. Goldberg shared, we know that exercise in many cases can be really helpful. So let me summarize this really quickly and then talk about something that can work and can't, or doesn't necessarily work. So we do know that gait balance and functional training, improving your leg, upper body, torso strength, uh, challenging your balance can work. Um, you know, the estimates, as we say, can vary, but 11 to 20% decreases in the risk of falls and fall injury, as well as fall rates. The really promising thing about this is that these can work for those with average risk for falls, as well as high risk for falls, as long as exercise is done carefully. One thing I'll add here is that these exercise programs with a strong evidence base can be done in community settings with groups at a local senior center, at a recreation facility, or they can be done at home using um, uh, various activities uh, that have been mentioned. So Tai Chi was one uh, example that really works to lower rates of falls by working on balance and coordination and muscle, uh, balance and coordination. That said, walking, which is a preferred activity, which has tons of cardiovascular and other benefits, has not actually been shown to prevent falls. So I'd really like to highlight this, that there are a number of multi-component exercise programs at work, but walking alone has not been shown with the evidence base to, to reduce fall risk. And one of the things to, to just be cautious that if um, someone does have significant balance impairments, exercise should be done with great care. It can help those at high risk for falls, but should be done with great care. So I'm gonna throw in a few resources here for those who are locally um, situated. The Washtenaw County Parks and Recreation has a Tai Chi for fall prevention activity that can be signed up for. Um, the Turner Senior Wellness Program has group exercise programs. Here's, um, you'll get on the slides um, some contact information. So what about multifactorial assessment management? This is a little different from multi-component exercise. Multifactorial assessment and management as a fall prevention strategy has had a very strong evidence base. These are customized interventions for the individual based on an initial comprehensive individualized fall risk assessment. So let's say you go to your medical annual, Medicare annual wellness visit and there can be some testing done and then they can design a unique plan just for you. This is very appropriate for high-risk patients. It can be time-intensive spread out over multiple office visits. It also results in large decreases in fall rates. This is something to ask your clinician about. Um, here are a few, here's a program in particular that's really worth noting is called a matter of balance. This is a clinically, um, uh, a clinically proven program to reduce fall injury. It is a cognitive behavioral intervention to reduce fear of falling by building your fall self-efficacy and perceived self-control. And good news for Michiganders, it's offered throughout the state for free. Here locally, it's at the Selene Senior Center. Um, and I also want to point out that UM has this really wonderful mobility assessment and enhancement clinic on Wednesday afternoons uh, on East Ann Arbor, um, on Plymouth Road at the East Ann Arbor um, clinics, and there's some contact information. Gait bounce and strength. Again, Dr. Goldberg mentioned these are absolutely critical way to prevent falls, balance tests, rising from a chair without your hands. They can be used to match a patient with a specific exercise program or a physical therapist. The Ann Arbor YMCA has a class that addresses this, moving for better balance. They work on falls prevention using principles and movements of Tai Chi. Um, and this um, is through a membership. There's a senior rate. Medication review is another critical thing. When we use prescription over-the-counter medications, sometimes there can be interactions, uh, poly, polypharmacy, we call it. And so in some cases, we just need to have a clinician or, or a pharmacist evaluate the relative harms and benefits, whether one should taper or discontinue a medication, taking into account the potential for fall risk weighed against the benefit of the drug. So what can happen are sedation, confusion, um, um, lowered blood pressure um, or interactions with alcohol use. Um, home modification was mentioned before. This has also been shown in systematic reviews and clinical trials to reduce falls. So especially those who have some limitations with getting around on their own, you can get a home safety evaluation through a home health agency through Medicare. 
Um, you'll probably need to turn to a community agency if you want to get modifications done. Medicare will pay for some adaptive equipment, as I mentioned, you, but you might have to go to a local pharmacist or consult a physician or geriatrician. Um, Habitat for Humanity of Washtenaw County has an aging in place home improvement program. Uh, for some adults who participate in the program, they can help install handrails, grab bars, and ramps. Um, and Catholic Social Service of Washtenaw County also has some programs where they will help do things like light bulb exchanges and installing raised toilet seats and here's some contact information. Um, vision and hearing are also critical to be a uh, stay atop of. So eye exams are recommended every one to two years for older adults. Those with poor eyesight, a home assessment by an occupational therapy is recommended. So I'm going through this quickly. I have a few minutes left. Behavioral therapy. Um, in some cases, we know that depressive symptomatology or depression is associated with pretty extensively increased risks of falls. That could be due to underlying um, risk factors that cause depression and fall risks like heart disease. It could be because people with depression take, um, take um, uh, SSRIs or medication to treat depression, which can exacerbate fall risk. It's not exactly known what exactly causes it. But one might consider if one is at high risk for falls in consultation with a geriatrician or physician, non-pharmacologic treatments or weighing the benefits and risks of pharmacologic treatments. Finally, dietary supplementation has really been big in the news over the past 10, 15 years when it comes to fall prevention. Um, in the past, the American Geriatric Society has recommended the use of vitamin D for bone strengthening, um, potentially to reduce fall risk. But in the most recent review in 2018, um, this is not recommended to prevent falls. Finally, I just in my last minute or two, want to share a few resources. Um, uh, so Dr. Goldberg mentioned the CDC's uh, steady older adult fall prevention toolkits. And I just want to share what some of these look like. They're really wonderful. Uh, again, I mentioned I did a study or I was fortunate to interview some individuals who were at risk for falls at, during a hospitalization who mentioned that they weren't really familiar with these resources. Um, they only take a minute to, to, to look at, um, and I think they might be worth your time. So there are resources targeted both at patients and family caregivers. And here's some of the different brochures. There's one for family caregivers on protecting your loved ones from falling. There's a check for safety brochure, a sustained independent brochure, what you can do to prevent fall, uh, falls, a chair rise exercise, and so on and so forth. Here's the one for checking your risk for falling. It's a series of questions where you answer yes or no to a number of questions, uh, a, a number of prompts, and you add up your scores, and it'll give you a sense of your risk for falls. You know, uh, we don't want people to be scared about falling. Um, we really want to promote the idea of you can promote your independence and stay independent longer if you are proactive about these things. But this is a good way to be proactive. Here's the brochure for four things you can do to prevent falls. Talking openly with your healthcare provider, ex exercising to improve strength and balance, having your eyes and feet checked, and making your home safer. Um, and uh, here's some of the interventions that we know really work well that you can find online or sometimes, like I've mentioned, at your local recreation center, community center, senior center, um, or YMCA, or through other organizations and services, um, service providers. So here are a bunch of exercise interventions, home modification, clinical, and multi-component interventions. Um, I'll just list a few briefly that are worth your attention. Uh, these aren't offered for free in Michigan, but you might be able to find these online. Uh, for, for purchase, Otago Exercise Program, this month's muscle, muscle strengthening and balance retraining is conducted at home. It has a really strong evidence base for reducing fall rates, and it's really good for older adults. Um, we have Tai Chi Moving for Better Balance offered at the local YMCA with weight shifting, postural realignment, coordinated movement, synchronized, synchronized breathing, uh, and it's available uh, locally in many communities. And then a matter of balance is what's offered in Michigan, which is really cool. It's for free. Eight-week structured group intervention to reduce fear of falling and increase activity levels. It's a cognitive behavioral program to increase your confidence in yourself and your ability to prevent falls. It has group discussions, role plays, exercise training uh, with, a, with, a, with a class coach or leader. So with that, um, I, uh, that is everything I have to present. And I thank you for your time. And we, I believe we'll now take questions. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Goldberg for the excellent presentation. Um, 
we'll start with the Q&A. And if you haven't put your questions in the Q&A chat box, please do so. Um, I see quite a few that have came through. And um, there has been a question pertaining to the lecture as well as the slides in which um, we will be um, sending those out one week to two weeks after the event. Um, it will take us some time to edit the video recording, but um, you will get that via inbox. But if not, please call the Turner Senior Resource Center at 734-998-9353. Once again, that's 734-998-9353. I'm gonna start with the first question that came in the chat from Wanda. I recently added core condition to my routine 15 minute twice a week workout. Should I increase the time? How does core conditioning help this fall topic? Well, let, let me take a stab at that one. Thank you for the question. Uh, so the first part was they did, the, the person has started doing it for 15 minutes twice a week. Should they increase? You know, exercise, it, it is important to progress our exercise as we get fitter and stronger and our balance improves. Um, it's a good start. You can certainly try and do and do more if you feel um, that 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 is that it's working for you and you're able to. You should always work safely and and you know within the limits of your own capabilities. Um, the other part of the question was how does it relate to to falls? Is that right, Jason? That's correct. Yeah. So uh, the strengthening of our of our core and i think that was what the question was strengthening of our core the, the the muscles of the trunk are very important they help to um uh, maintain balance sustain our uh, sustain us um in terms of uh, of um balance activities um control us as as we as we resist the forces that come into uh to to perturb our balance uh, on a daily uh, daily basis good strong trunk muscles whether it's of the abdomen as well as the the back the back muscles are really important uh, for that. Another way that the trunk helps is if let, let me back up. One of the ways that we stop ourselves from falling is to take a rapid step. If we are unable to take that rapid step and we're going down, having good strong trunk muscles may actually help to reduce the acceleration as we as we hurtle towards the ground and may help us to avoid an injury. So control, because what happens is that the trunk flexes and one of the things we want to try and do, the trunk flexes and rotates forward as we're falling. One of the things we want to do is if we've got good strength, good strength in our trunk, good trunk control, we may be able to sort of uh, reduce the rate at which the acceleration is happening and potentially uh, avoid a, a, an injury. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. The next question up is for you as well from uh, Nancy. Um, instead of the standard sit to stand exercise, for those of us who have knee damage and experience pain when trying that stand sit to stand for regular squats. Okay, so 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 Nancy said that she's doing sit to stands. She probably has uh, maybe some arthritis in the knee, and she's getting intense pain as as she does those um, sit to stands. That's, that's my understanding. Uh, one of the things that you can do to exercise the, um, the, the lower leg muscles in that case is in a, you can do it in a number of uh, different positions. You can sit you can sit in a chair, Nancy, and you can put weights around the cuff weights as I did in one of the pictures there. You can put cuff weights around your leg and straighten the leg and then, then just from a straightened position, just bend the knee down about 30 degrees. You do not have to go all the way down back to 90 degrees. And in fact, if you do go all the way back down to 90 degrees, in the presence of arthritis, you may aggravate um, that arthritis as well as the, uh, the area behind your kneecap. So I'm gonna suggest as you do those knee extensions with the weights around your leg, that you just do it in the, from, from where you're level, level, um, level with the, the surface and just bend your knee down about 30 degrees and you go up and down in that very last 30 degree range and you'll get good exercise for your, for your leg like that. You could also do standing knee bends. So instead of doing sit to stand, where you go all the way from sit to stand and then all the way down, you could stand against a, a kitchen table. Um, uh, you could stand, uh, you know, holding onto the kitchen table if you need the balance and just bend once again, very gently, only about 30 degrees. You do not have to do deep squats. You do not need to do, in fact, I would recommend that you do, that, that you do not do those deep squats. Uh, the same as you, you might not, it might be too hard to go from sit to stand. 
puts a lot of, of uh, force on the on the knees and 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 the, and the kneecap. Rather do uh, standing, holding onto the kitchen counter or the back of a chair, and do very gentle knee bends for about the first 25 to 35, maybe 30 degrees. So you're still getting a good workout for your lower leg muscles, but you're not uh, incurring any more damage to the, the back of the kneecap and to the knee joint surfaces. Thank you, Dr. Colbert. The next question is, uh, what is the best way to climb stairs when there is no railing? Okay, interesting. Yeah, I saw that question came in. Um, so obviously it's better to have railing if, if you can. If you don't have a railing uh, and it's feasible to put one up, then, then try and do that. But if, let's assume that there is no option for putting up a railing. I would suggest, and I'm gonna assume that the person has no other injuries, and we'll talk about a situation where they do have an injury. Let's assume they have no injuries and they don't need a uh, crutches or whatever to ascend and descend the stairs. And I'm assuming there's at least one wall on, on, the, on, the, on, uh, on the side of the stairs. I would strongly suggest that you contact, or when I say contact, I mean touch the side of the wall so that you get that sort of haptic touch sensation, which, and just a little bit of sensation by touching the wall uh, should give you a lot more steadiness than if you go down uh, without, touching, uh, without touching the wall. That's why going down the stairs with, uh, with a load of laundry and not contacting any, uh, a, a railing or the side of the wall is, is very dangerous and people fall frequently. Now, let's say there's a situation where you're going up and down the stairs, there's no railings, and, you're, and you are using crutches, then you have to, you, you should, a physical therapist should have taught you how to use the crutches to make sure that you go up and down the stairs safely. But essentially, when you're going up, it's up with the, with the good leg. Uh, you, you lead up with the good leg, and then you bring the crutches and the weaker leg. And if you're going down, it's down with, like, say, I, I hate to use the term bad leg, but you that thing is a bad leg, like the weaker leg. Uh, down with lead down, uh, good up with the good and down with the bad. So you lead down with the with with the weaker with the weaker leg and the crutches, and then you bring the good leg down. I hope that helps. Thank you. The next question is, um, what are the best shoes to wear when walking? And this is a great question, honestly, because I recently had my feet measured and I was wearing the wrong size shoes my entire life. So I always recommend getting your feet measured. But yeah, yeah. And in that in that vein, uh, Jason, yeah, your right. shoe wear, shoes shoe wear is really important. I made some notes on this one because I saw that question was coming in. Um, you know, you, if if you look at some of the brochures on on older adult uh, on older adult um, exercises, they talk of um, utilize, and you see, there's always pictures of people using athletic shoes. Uh, the, the shoes, so athletic shoes with a good tight a good fit. Are important. You don't want to make them too tight that you're squeezing your foot into it, but you don't want to make them loose either. That as you're walking, they're sort of like a pseudo flip flop. You definitely don't want that. They also should not have uh, slip soles. So no, no, no non-slip soles. Uh, they shouldn't have. They shouldn't be smooth underneath because you could slip like that. And also, the weight of the shoe should not be too heavy. You don't want to be lugging something that weighs it weighs far too much. Uh, I recommend closed heels because that'll enhance stability. Uh, you know, if, if the heels are open at the back, uh, you, you could run into problems uh, catching your feet uh, and, and, and slipping. Um, the, so the soles should not be too flexible. Um, you know, you don't want them to be too flexible because then you're kind of, you're not really getting the benefit of stability that the shoe might afford you. So a good fitting shoe is really important uh, in, in, in preventing falls. And just as you're exercising, um, you know, whether you're in the gym, whether you're going for a brisk walk or whatever you're doing, um, shoes are important. The shoes that you wear are important. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. The next question up um, is for Dr. Hoffman, which um, you covered some of these or some classes that are offered, but what exercises do you recommend? And um, the second component to the question is, does Medicare offer a free local class on balance? Yeah, thank you, Jason. I, I would refer the specific exercise questions to Dr. Goldberg. Um, oh, sure. But, uh, you know, certainly the ones mentioned, you know, I think in Michigan, Medicare doesn't really cover these classes. What we're relying on is typically state funding. Um, 
or uh, funding through what are called the area agencies on aging or AAA. We have the 1B AAA, uh, which is Southeast Michigan covering Washtenaw County. And um, they like other AAAs um, through, um, through federal funding for aging related um, topics have um, sponsored the Matter of Balance class, which you can find at local senior centers. So um, that would be the free resource in this community. Other states like Maine offer, you know, different programs. They tend to be a little more generous when it comes to these prevention resources for community members. Um, so other than that, um, one would have to look through community centers, the recreation centers, some of the ones that I, the one, some of the ones that I mentioned. Um, so yeah. And then Dr. Goldberg, do you have anything to piggyback on that question? Um, can you just repeat the question, the, 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 the part about what the, the exercises were? What, um, the question is, what exercises do you recommend? Okay, so many, and I purposely put in my slides uh, some examples of exercises um, because many of those exercises do in fact um, help you to um, work on strength, on balance, as well as on uh, cardio or aerobic endurance. So uh, many of those I recommend. There are some booklets. There's actually a book by the National Institute on Aging. Uh, if you go to the National Institute on Aging, Jason, I will give you the, the, um, the reference for this. It's a free download. While Dr. Hoffman was talking, I actually went and looked at it on, online. Um, and it's, it's Go for Life, if I'm correctly. G-O, the number four, and life. And there's a free download, and we've got some wonderful exercises in there. But have a look at some of the some of the exercises that I showed you in in in, in my uh, in my presentation. Thank you, and I'll I'll include the link in the. And I'll get you the link slides. for that, Jason. I'll get you the link for that. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. The um, next question up is um, how important is going to the gym for seniors for balance? So how Jeff, I'll take that one. So how important is going to the gym? Well, it's it's more important that we that those of us in, in this segment of the population, 65 plus, of which I've just joined a couple of months ago, um, going to the gym is certainly important, but it's not an absolute necessary to go to the gym to do our exercises. I purposely showed you that you can get a really good workout at home using body weight, using some relatively inexpensive cuff weights. So going to the gym is good. If there's good socialization aspects of that, meeting up with friends at the gym, maybe exercising, seeing other people, but you certainly, we should not be under any misconception that if you cannot get to the gym for whatever reason due to finances or transport, that you should not exercise. Because we can we can literally exercise in the in a, in a, in a room that is the, that is five foot by five foot, uh, or maybe a little more, and and do exercises literally on the spot, so to speak. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. The next question up um, is many of the physical activities described require a significant level of cognition. Considering that some older adults are at risk for cognitive impairments, for an example, Alzheimer's disease, how are these activities adaptable for these populations? Okay. Um, so it is important that, that uh, people with cognitive impairments, uh, mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, whatever it is, uh, maintain, uh, engage in physical activity because there are health benefits um, to all of us uh, well, for, for, for many uh, of, those, um, of, of those activities. There's, there's distinct health benefits. But in saying that, we do need to make sure that, that uh, individuals with cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease are safe to do those exercises. So there's different ways that we could do, that we could, the different types of activities that we can, ha that we can have people with cognitive impairments um, uh, do we could first of all we could do them in short mini sessions. They could work with a partner, whether it's a spouse, a friend, a colleague, um, doing shorter sessions. They could engage in walking if they're able to walk. Short sessions of walking, uh, activities such as gardening and housework have been recommended. Um, they can do light housework, stretch bands, those therabands that the physical therapists use a lot. You could do it in a seated position. So a lot of the exercises that I showed you could be, some of them could be done in a seated position. They could use soup cans or cuff weights, the weights that I had around my arm and around my leg. 
You could show the individual how to, how to move through the range of motion and to do those in a supervised fashion. It's not necessary that you must go to the gym to do those. So people with, with uh, cognitive impairments, dementia, whatever it is, certainly should engage in exercise or physical activity as they're able to. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. The next question up is from Colleen. Are there any studies comparing the health system in the United States versus other countries and populations um, fall increase and in mortality as a result? Uh, I'll take this, Dr. Goldberg. Um, so to my knowledge, there's not a lot of comparative literature um, on international healthcare systems when it comes to um, when it comes to fall injury, there's substantial literature on, you know, the large differences in how the systems are structured in terms of their insurance programs, uh, you know, countries with um, universal coverage um, tend to do better on a number of measures when it comes to access to healthcare, when it comes to prevention, and a lot of the things that we've talked about that um, that are implicated in chronic disease and other important risk factors. So I think it's safe to say that a lot of the sort of precursors that we uh, have concerns about when it comes to fall risks um, are going to be addressed differently in systems that have more universal comprehensive coverage. They're probably gonna have less gaps when it comes to unmet functional needs. Um, but in terms of specific studies illustrating sort of head to head, um, you know, how performance looks when it comes to prevention or treatment of fall injuries. I haven't seen anything on that. What I can say is we have pretty big disparities, um, like I showed when it comes to prevalence of fall injuries. Um, I haven't seen that done in other countries. I would imagine after you get rid of differences in sort of geography and climate that tend towards differential fall risks, you might see less variation in other areas, but it's a, it's a great question, a good area for future study. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. The next question up is, do any of the programs teach how to properly fall um, to avoid injury? I don't know if, Jeff, I don't, Dr. Hoffman, I don't know specifically if matter of balance and some of those actually teach you how to fall. Uh, do you know, do you know? To my knowledge, I haven't seen that. I had a family member ask me about this recently. Um, to me, I think we're more thinking about how to prevent a fall if you trip or stumble or slip, how you yeah. get yeah. sort of center of mass. How you recover, yeah. Yeah. And then separately, we do know that once someone falls, there are differences in the characteristics of those who tend to have an injury versus not. We saw you know, some of the exercise programs reduce hip fracture and other types of injury. Um, but we also know like extra body mass, higher BMIs are associated with less risk of a fall injury. So if you have osteoporosis, you're more likely to fall uh, with an injury. So, so, you know, one way to address is just think as a generalized prevention method to just engage in some of these exercises, balance, gait training, et cetera. The, the gait training will help you avoid the slips, trips, and stumbles you know, the power and strength and coordination stuff will help you uh, recover after a trip, slip or stumble. Um, but as far as once you've fallen, you know, I've heard, I've been contacted in the past. I worked at the VA about, you know, inflatable sort of balloons to fall on. Um, these aren't sci-fi. People are developing all sorts of things like this. Um, the only thing I've really heard about actually how to fall are things like jujitsu or martial arts, which I think is a little maybe out of our scope here, but I, I, that's what I know. Let me just add one thing, Jeff, on the martial arts thing. There's a study that Neil Alexander, Dr. Alexander from the University of Michigan is going to be involved in. It's called the Falling Safety Training Study, and he's going to be involved in that. And it's based on martial arts, and it's based on, on I believe, the tuck and roll uh, concept. So they're going to be actually training people, uh, uh, teaching them how to fall. So yeah. it sounds like maybe there isn't clarity on what's the best way to fall. But as Dr. Hoffman said, the martial arts way may be to go, because that's that's actually the basis for the study that Dr. Alexander and his colleagues uh, at other institutions are going to be working on. The protocol for that is actually just being published this year in 2023. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It sounds very interesting. Um, the next question is a little bit more personal, but 
what are each of the presenters' personal practices in their everyday life to put into action? I assume you mean in terms of physical activity? Fall prevention, physical activity. Okay, so I'll just, I try and take the stairs as, as much as possible. Um, I do try to get to the gym three times a week. I, it, it doesn't always work. But if I don't get to the gym, I try and intersperse activities at home. And one of the papers that I read uh, was, was a study out of, I think, Australia, where they they intersperse uh, physical activity throughout the day and make it a habit. So when you're going into the kitchen to, um, to boil the kettle or to peel the potatoes for your dinner that night, you maybe do some knee bends. You stand at the kitchen counter as the kettle is boiling and you do some and you do some exercises and you build up this amount of and I've started to do that in the last month or so. Um, so yes, I could do I could do better. Um, and it, it's 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 trying to train ourselves to actually just keep on doing as much as we can. And I do try and do some aerobic, some strength and some balance activities each week as well. That's my personal program. I I'm a father of a one and three year old, so I'm pretty sure I do everything incorrectly in terms of what's good for my body. I don't sleep enough and I lift kids inappropriately without bending my knees correctly all the time. Uh, but but less jokingly, I, I try to do um, you know things like planks and core strength, which I think really help with coordination and balance, which are really critical for the topic we're discussing, um, as well as aerobics. So I try to adhere to the slide uh, that was shown earlier by Dr. Boberg about about two days a week of some sort of strength or muscle building or resistance training, yeah. and then three or four days a week when I can of, of some sort of light cardio. Um, yeah. And I, and just with the last question, I just wanted to, I, you know, one of the reasons we don't know why the evidence-based programs teach falling safely is you can't really test that in a clinical trial. You can't make people fall and see you fell better or not. So I just wanted to point that out. If you're seeing us kind of like, Hey, we haven't heard of that. That's one of the reasons why. The literature does say that 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 um, in terms of adherence to the guidelines, uh, we're doing a little bit better in, in terms of adhering to the aerobic guidelines. And the numbers are that about 37% of old adults meet the aerobic guidelines, but the number is about the percent proportion of, of old adults meeting the strength guidelines is dramatically lower. And that is really, really important that we engage in strengthening exercise. I cannot stress enough the importance of of working on uh, muscles of the lower extremity, even muscles of the upper extremity, because those can also help us prevent a fall if we're walking and we and we trip. We may not be able to get our leg out in time, but we may be able to grab onto something. So the, the upper extremity is really important, as, as are the trunk muscles as well. So it's critically important. And I do find this in people who come into, into, uh, into my studies that I ask them, are you doing strengthening exercises? Many of them are doing aerobic and cardio, but not, and, and balance, but not strengthening. It's really, really important. All right. Um, we have more questions. However, the time has now come. It's 1.30. So to be mindful of everybody's time, um, thank you so much for attending the lecture. Special thank you to Dr. Goldberg and to Dr. Hoffman for your excellent presentation. We will be sharing um, the video recording as well as all the, the slides. And additionally, we will be sending out an evaluation survey at the end. So please take the survey. It allows us to um, better improve our Healthy Aging Lecture Series. And please join us next week for our topic on brain health. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Goldberg. And uh, thank you, Dr. Hoffman, for your time. Thank and you. thank you for everybody for participating. Thank you for okay, having thanks. us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.